Good morning, good afternoon to you from wherever you're joining us today. I'm Muslim Layode and I'll be your host for today. And I would like to warmly welcome you to this session, PPE for All, Protect Community Health Workers Now, an update on COVID-19 Action Fund for Africa. Last month, we announced the COVID-19 Action Fund for Africa to secure PPE for 1 million community health workers across 24 sub-Saharan African countries who together provide essential health services to 400 million people. This fund is multi-country, evidence-based, radically collaborative, integrated with national responses, serving the invisible cater and privately funded. It's important to note that this effort has been underway for several months now and involves 30 partners across sectors and works with more than 20 ministries of health. Today, you will have the unique opportunity to hear from teams from East Africa to West Africa and beyond who share why we have undertaken this critical effort, our progress to date, and how this helps us build health for all. As you can imagine, we cannot have an impactful session um, without a fantastic panel of speakers. So today, we're going to hear from Madeline Ballard, Tapi Tapiwa Mukwashi. We're going to hear from Thomas Taig, Ramatu Usman Jalo, James Nadella, Tom Cole, and English Song. I'll now take a quick moment to run through today's agenda. And we're going to start by looking at the challenge. What exactly is the challenge we're faced with? And then we'll examine the solutions that we have um, available to us. And then we're going to be examining our progress so far. And more importantly, why does this matter? Why are we having this conversation? And so we would hear testimonies from frontline workers and then we would examine opportunities for us all to get involved. And more importantly, investment matters. So we're going to be rounding up with this part of, of we're going to be rounding up the conversation, discussing this with both Thomas Cole and English Song. So um, it is my delight at this point to pass on the virtual mic um, to Madeline. Um, before I do that, I just want to quickly say that um, the presentations will be up on the, on the screen all through and you'll have the opportunity to download them immediately afterwards. And we have a Q&A box um, where you can input your questions or comments all through the session and we'll get to them within the, uh, within the hour. In the event that we're unable to answer your questions um, during the course of today's conversation, we'll be happy to follow up with you afterwards. So over to you, Madeline. Thanks so much, Masoon. Um, much appreciated. So what is the challenge we're facing? Uh, at this point, many of you will already have been familiar with it. Basically, as COVID-19 spread in March, um, the demand for PPE grew by a factor of 100 and prices skyrocketed. Um, and so a global shortage of gloves, masks, and eye protection obviously affected all health workers. Um, but it quickly became apparent to the Community Health Impact Coalition back in March that the brunt was the brunt of this shortage was falling on low and middle income countries uh, and community health workers in particular. Not only was there an absolute shortage, uh, but there was a major distributional problem as well. Uh, we saw in country after country that CHWs were being excluded from national PPE projections, despite the life-saving work that they undertake. And uh, this is having devastating consequences. While we know that everyone is uh, quote unquote over hearing about COVID, COVID is unfortunately far from over. As you can see uh, in the animation running on the screen behind me, cases in Africa continue to rise by 6% every single day. We are mid emergency. Community health workers are meanwhile at the front lines preventing, detecting, and responding to this outbreak. Yet without PBE, they put themselves and their patients at risk. In every 
country, and I want to make this clear, in every country covered by the fund, all 24 countries, um, CHWs are relied on for services as diverse as malaria testing, providing vaccinations, malnutrition case management, case finding, home-based care for COVID patients. And this is the critical part. None of what I just mentioned, none of these services can be done over the phone from six feet away or with only a homemade mask. And it's reductions in precisely these types of services that often kill more than the pandemic itself. We saw that during Ebola and we're already unfortunately seeing this now due to the lack of PPE for frontline workers. Moreover, CHWs go house to house. So without P PPE, they risk becoming disease vectors themselves. Um, and we've already seen again, following the drop in access to protective gear on the continent, there was a 203% increase in COVID-19 infections among healthcare workers. And this is in the context, of course, of an already acute health worker shortage. Meanwhile, the evidence couldn't be clearer. A recent JAMA article, uh, the first study actually looking at PPE for CHWs in COVID, found that without complete PPE, nearly one out of every five CHWs were infected with COVID. With complete PPE, so a mask, gloves, face shields, none, 0% were infected whilst carrying out their door-to-door -door duties. If we had a drug that worked that well, we'd be sending it to every health worker on earth. Yet, in communities around the globe, CHWs who are the face of essential services are still going without this essential tool to continue their work, continue their work in providing essential services. Um, I, I'm gonna tell it to you straight. The unequal distribution of PPE we think reflects the existing biases about the worth of the life-saving work that CHWs do and uh, it needs to be corrected. There needs to be a preferential option to correct it and that's what we've tried to develop here. PPE from an epidemiological standpoint very clearly should be distributed based on the services provided not on the service provider uh, and that's what we all got together here to correct. So to address this problem this amazing team uh, worked with countries to scope and actually quantify PPE needs for CHWs providing essential health services in 24 African countries. And basically as Moussin shared, everything that this fund is doing is 100% evidence-based, verified with ministries of health um, and, uh, and based on, on, on these verified projections. And our, our rapid analysis, and you can see that on the screen here now, found that the need for PPE was immense. Over 400 millions of pieces of PPE were needed uh, to protect these workers, to maintain the essential health services um, that, again, so often get disrupted during pandemics and are at risk of being disrupted, literally, as we're speaking to you now. But uh, to respond to this crisis, we did what so many of the organizations involved, and as Musin mentioned, there are over 30, um, plus all of our Ministry of Health partners. We put in place a plan to both meet this acute need, because again, we're in a crisis, even though it might not feel like it, we are absolutely in a crisis. You saw that case rate climbing, while at the same time, building health systems for the long term. How can, at this moment, you, we use PPE as a wedge to further institutionalize community health workers uh, within ministries of health and within health systems across the globe? So uh, to explain our approach and how we're doing both these things, responding to a crisis and building health systems at the same time, uh, I'm really proud to introduce my colleague, Tapiwa Mukwashi, Director, Supply Chain at Village Reach. Thank you, Madeleine. So our solution has been to embrace a radical collaboration to protect community health workers. And uh, this has been seen through a shift from the traditional approach where organizations have been viciously guarding their pursuits to one way organizations welcome deep collaboration. Uh, as highlighted by Madeleine, under the CAPA initiative, 30 organizations spanning 24 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa we have come together to cooperate in establishing a supply chain operation to deliver PPE to the last mile as part of a coordinated um, emergency response effort. 
I want to go over three strategies that have been important in this work. We knew that in order to mobilize resources, we had to accurately quantify what was needed to protect community health workers. Uh, we, we hear over and over again that we needed 448 million pieces of PPE. And to achieve this uh, figure, we undertook a joint determination of need. Uh, this included one, a quantification and a gap analysis. And to achieve a broad buy-in to allow organizations to rally behind the quantification, we used a participatory approach that recognized national systems, that recognized national structures established to focus for medical uh, commodities within the ministries of health. And so we worked jointly with several organizations um, who work under the Community Health Impact Coalition and the Community Health Acceleration Partnership in across the 24 countries to support the ministries of health in inputting assumptions related to community health workers, the number of community health workers serving in different locations, the type of PPE that was required to provide the services that they were authorized to do. And it was very important for us to ensure that this quantification was done under the ambits of existing structures and mechanisms because we want to ensure that this effort um, adopts a, a system strengthening approach uh, in, in a way that where a system to focus for community health workers does not exist, we contribute to establishing it. Where a system exists to focus for community health workers, we provide additional technical support that ensures that the community health workers are recognized, uh, included in supply planning and the following uh, budgeting processes. And through this process, we have been able to see that a number of ministries of health across the 24 countries are now more aware of the number of community health workers working on different projects in the geographies that they, they provide. They are prioritizing community health worker interventions in that they are including in supply planning processes, last mile logistics, all the elements that are required to receive and deploy items to the community health workers as needed. So we recognize that community health workers need to be, prom to be protected now, but they also need to be protected into the future. This is a long-term thing. This is not a stop measure to just protect them now and vanish once the emergency is gone. And so we are looking at the processes working with the ministries of health with a long-term uh, focus and that's why we are following a systematic approach and in a big way this initiative is allowed for the ministries of health to see that community health workers are important and must be integrated into planning and budgeting to allow for us to create efficiencies um, that traditionally uh, are missed by many players in in the sector around procuring at competitive prices, procuring uh, in large quantities. Uh, we established a pooled procurement mechanism leveraging on the competencies and expertise of direct relief. Um, and so a number of the orders that different partners were meant to be procuring on their own, uh, on a non-competitive basis, uh, were pulled together, uh, leveraged on an order platform created by direct relief. And this has seen us uh, I'm saying this because we've benchmarked the prices that have been achieved by direct relief with what is being achieved by other partners. So the, we're getting competitive price, we're getting competitive delivery times, and this has been very good in creating the efficiencies and effectiveness that are required in this initiative. I, I, I like this slide for uh, one thing. The graphic here gives a full story about how we have many players in, in this sector who would ordinarily be competing in the geography, coming together under one voice to work with an entity that is the capability to procure across three continents, uh, to arrange the first mile logistics related to uh, whether it's air shipments, ocean shipments, and delivering them to the points of entry across the 24 countries. We have worked with in-country partners to support the Ministry of Health in supporting middle middle mile logistics, uh, customs clearance, staging the, and storing the items at the central medical stores and repacking the 
commodities into kits and delivering them into the last mile. So this whole coordination, this whole cooperation amongst the stakeholders across many geographies really points to a radically col collaborative mechanism which is a capacity to continue benefiting community health workers and elevating and prioritizing them into the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tapiwa. We really appreciate all the work that you're doing. Um, at this point, we would like to invite um, Thomas Taig, um, the CEO of Direct Relief, to share the progress so far. Thomas. Thank you very much, Masoon, and thank you <clears throat> to everybody who's taken the time to, to join us today. It's a privilege for Direct Relief to be part of this collaboration and this uh, global coordinated effort. You know, the old joke is everyone is for coordination as long as they are the coordinator. Um, and that is not the case here. I think it's uh, a rare privilege for us to be part of this. So I think the slide uh, that you can that's up right now, you can see what the progress has been. I think it's um, 42 million units of PPE, uh, 12 countries so far. I think we're breaking it down um, by um, the type of product. And just as kind of a, a couple of contextual points I think are important, at least uh, from my perspective. Direct Relief, this was the largest purchase that our organization has made in 72 years, other than the building uh, that we built so that we could be an accredited drug distributor. As, as a signal of the seriousness with which our organization takes this, I think uh, as Madeline and others have said, the, the role and importance of community health workers is unquestioned. We saw it in Ebola, we see, you know, in, in the United States directly for supporting community health workers here for the exact same reason. They prevent hospitalizations, they detect disease early, they keep people healthy and out of the hospital. It's a low cost, high value, high impact investment. And it, it's unfathomable that they're last in line for support, um, but they are. So I think the effort uh, is to really mobilize the private philanthropic resources as the, the public institutions are clearly overwhelmed. By way of contrast, you know, the WHO reported recently um, what their provision has been for this effort. And I think you can see, uh, they reported that they've been able to provide 3 million surgical masks and the consortium has delivered 22 million so far, plus 500,000 KN95 masks. WHO reported that they were able to provide 2 million gloves um, the consortium has provided 35 million. Uh, WHO reported they could provide 200,000 surgical gowns. The consortium has provided 975,000 so far. WHO reported they could pro uh, have provided 100,000 face shields and the consortium has provided 850,000 so far and we're still far short. So, I think that, you know, as an example, that's a pretty sobering reality, and it's not a criticism of WHO. It's a, it's an observation of what's needed to complement their efforts, and those are the ministries. Uh, it's unreasonable to expect that uh, here in the United States, uh, where we're struggling to just do PPE, that we can expect countries with far fewer resources to mobilize and connect them on their own without some help. So, I think the idea and the urgency of it uh, has been clear. The value of community health workers is, is proven. And so it's been a real privilege for Direct Relief to, to join with the 29 other groups and put forward both what we have, what we do um, and work with all those. For everyone listening, I think it's, um, you know, it's a rare occasion where, you know, everyone's expertise and what they bring is leveraged by everyone else's, including anyone who, who contributes funds. The groups are using what they've got. They're not charging this fund to do it. This is what they do and this is what Direct Relief does. So I think it's um, uh, the, the photos you saw if you tuned in early of the, the flights leaving from Shenzhen, that was World Food Program. Uh, that's the backbone kind of uh, operational arm of the United Nations. They agreed to haul this for free. So it's been 240 tons on 11 cargo flights that had we done it, even at low cost, it would have been four to five million dollars in costs that have been averted. So really the, the funding pool 
is to just obtain the, the items at the lowest cost possible. And we've been very fortunate to be able to do that. Direct relief cost of goods uh, obtained is usually zero because companies like 3M and BD are so generous with their product contributions. Um, that's not possible in this case as the world market has been so upset, prices remain high. And I think when we have been able to go out and purchase with the $10 million that Direct Relief put forward, followed by the two and a half million dollars that the Crown Family Philanthropies put in, um, which was astounding, the pricing that we've been able to get, it's not, it's, it's discounted because it's not a commercial arms length transaction. People understand the groups involved. We have no agenda. We're just trying to get uh, help with uh, really right now a relatively small pot of money to people who don't have it, won't get it otherwise, and need it now. I will add that um, direct relief works in emergencies. And one of the things you learn is that uh, an emergency means you've got to move. You cannot analyze um, global warming in all of its context when there's a fire burning outside town. So I think you have to do it thoughtfully, but it has to be done fast. So I think it's a privilege for us to be part of it. We're committed, obviously, deeply to seeing it through. And for anyone who's in a position to participate uh, in any way, please know that you will get uh, the, the best efforts of all, all 30 of us collaborating partners. Thank you very much. And I'll send it back to Masoon. Thank you, Thomas, um, for, for framing this and, and, uh, and sharing your insights. Um, I think this is one of the most exciting parts of this conversation when we get to hear um, from someone working on the front line. So I would like to invite Ramachu Jalo, a community health worker supervisor in Sierra Leone, um, to share experiences from the front lines and also underscore the importance of the investing in this space. Uh, while we wait for, for Ramatu, I will just move straight on to James Nadella, the Chief Program Officer at Last Mile Health, to share his bit of this presentation. Good to see everyone. You know, as the lead collaborators have made clear today, uh, our actions in this um, effort can establish either a, virtual, a virtuous cycle or a vicious cycle in our overall ambition to protect frontline and community health workers. So I see the, the virtuous cycle would be enabled by protecting frontline and community health workers with PPE. We know that this would enable continuity of essential health services and allow the workforce to safely prevent, detect, and respond to the coronavirus. So we've, we've seen that community health workers can maintain treatments for malaria, assessments for malnutrition, and support for pregnant women. They can provide community education on COVID, they can increase practices like universal masking, and they can refer suspected cases for COVID. And we believe that they can also contribute to testing, contact tracing, and eventually support the distribution and delivery of a vaccine in the future. But as people have made clear, none of that's possible without PPE. So with PPE, there's a virtuous cycle. Well-supported community health workers ensure safer and healthier communities, healthier communities. But conversely, inaction right now will lead to a vicious cycle. If community health workers aren't equipped with PPE, they'll be faced with the difficult choice of putting themselves and their families at risk, and many will be sent home. Uh, governments are not going to reap the potential value and they may actually start to decrease their investment in strong community health worker networks and systems. And that would leave vulnerable communities at the last mile behind, not just in relation to COVID, but in our overall efforts to increase UHC. So I see us standing at a crossroads right now. PPE will determine which scenario is realized, a vicious or virtuous cycle. And I know that many of you already agree that CHWs need to be protected, that obviously we have to choose the virtuous cycle. And so if we believe that, that protecting them is important and we need to do that at scale, that's going to require a number of actions 
it's not to this fund alone, um, but it will need to include this fund and pooled procurement as an option. So let me put that in perspective from Last Mile Health. So in March, we launched into our own efforts to directly procure PPE and needed to purchase immediately 2.5 million units of PPE for our work in Liberia and Malawi. We pursued direct procurement because there was no other option available to us at the time. The Ministry of Health procurement was not prioritizing community health workers. The WHO and WFP system was not available. The Africa Medical Supplies Platform didn't yet exist. This COVID Action Fund for Africa didn't exist yet. So it was an odyssey for us to vet suppliers to find even a single viable shipping option. In the, the shipping costs ended up being above $70,000 and the process took more than five months. So if I compare what we're talking about today to that direct procurement effort, we expect this COVID Action Fund for Africa to reduce the uncertainty, provide some better control for quality, move products more quickly and drive down the unit costs by negotiating and pooling these larger quantities as Tom talked about. So we have an option in front of us. It's one of a number of efforts that we need to get behind together. And I can see the real value as, an, as, uh, as we lead implementation in a couple of the countries where this effort is underway. Thank you very much, James. So um, we have Ramatu. We're not going to do this without a frontline worker testimony. So Ramatu, over Great. to you. Thank you, James. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry for the sh short of communication. Yeah, what I'm saying here, I'm protecting um, community health worker is like if you are protecting the whole nation. Because the community health workers, we are the frontliners, just as you said. And most of us here in Sierra Leone, um, we are victim of HIV positive. So our human is very low. Quickly to um, collect different diseases from other patients. So during this COVID, um, the best thing you have ever done is to protect us because it gives us confidence to do our job because we are the bridge between the community to the facility. And mind you, we are dealing with some um, local people. Sometimes social distance is very hard to maintain because they used to us, not just for COVID, we are um, community health workers for different types of diseases, especially HIV and tuberculosis. They used to us before COVID coming very closer, right? So just because of COVID, we cannot just keep off from our people. So protecting us is the best thing for the whole world. CHWs, where you protect CHWs, you protect the nation, right? So as I'm here as a frontliner, I, I really happy of being protected. So PE is necessary for me to do a better job because it gives me the confidence to go closer, to move to the last step, the last door, right? So it's very, very important. I think it's not just um, PPE for all, but PPE forever for CHW, right? Because um, we go out there meeting with different affected people, then coming back home to meet our own people you know, it's very risky. So PPE forever for CHW, I advocate for, right? So I don't think I have to go further. But just I'm saying here, it's necessary for community health workers to be protected forever because we are there to do every work for everyone that needs assistance. PIH have done a lot. They have take us from somewhere. Then we want to take people from somewhere too, right? As you can see, PIH have changed my life from being a patient, now at least a supervisor that we supervise people that look after sick people. And I enjoy doing the job. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ramatu. Thank you for your passionate delivery and... Um, we applaud your bravery and, and we're grateful for the amazing work that, that you do um, every day. Thank you. Um, at, at this point, it, it would be great to hear um, from those who have invested, um, who 
have their own stories to share on why they did this. And so we're, we're going to pass the virtual mic over to Tom Cole from Crown Plus, from Crown Family Philanthropies um, and English Soul from Soul Family Foundation to share their own story. Over to you, Tom and English. Uh, thank you, Mosun. It's an honor to be part of this effort. Crown Family Philanthropies has been committed to global health equity and the pursuit of universal health coverage for over a decade with initial investments focused in Sub-Saharan Africa. The emphasis on CHWs came out of important lessons from our partners working on the front lines of the Ebola epidemic in West Africa in 2014 and 2015. It wasn't just about service delivery, it was about strengthening health systems which were pretty fragile and weak at the time. In the words of one of our long-term partners, Paul Farmer, you needed to be looking at staff, stuff, space, and systems all at once. By listening to Paul, Raj, Raj Punjabi, and our other partners, we understood that to have success meant an investment in a community health worker model. Over time, Data has shown that one of the most cost-effective and efficient ways to achieving universal health coverage across Sub-Saharan Africa is by investing in frontline health workers like Ramatu in Sierra Leone. In practical terms, this means they're properly trained, supervised, equipped, and salaried to do their jobs. Last March, Raj Punjabi, Madeline Ballard, and Josh Nesbitt from Medic Mobile were speaking with us during a strategy meeting, ironically our first Zoom meeting of this present era. Their words, born out of experience dealing with other pandemics such as Ebola, outlined some key priorities to fight COVID-19. First, you got to protect health workers. Second, you need to interrupt the virus. Third, you need to maintain existing healthcare, healthcare services while surging their capacity. I spent the next few months just listening. Probably the best thing we can do as a donor. Weekly COVID-19 operational calls organized by Sheik identified that most frontline community health workers lack the basic PPE needed to maintain their routine service delivery. And that health worker rates of infection were far higher than the communities they served. When word first circulated of a potential fund to meet this need in, su in Sub-Saharan Africa, it was a no-brainer for our support. We understood that this was a top priority. Thank you, and back to you, Mosun. Thank you very much, Tom. I'll pass this on to English to, to round out the conversation. English. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mosun. And, um, Wow, what a privilege to be part of this conversation. I, I just wanna first echo everything that my colleagues have said. And um, just, you know, this is a, uh, this is something that, that, that our, our group at CHAP is, is just supremely excited to be a part of. Um, you know, we got involved, CHAP has supported CHW Ventures over the last seven years, focusing on investments that strengthen systems change. Um, from Financing Alliance to Chic to Amp Health and, and even more recently, the Community Health Roadmap. When COVID-19 hit, I think, you know, like Tom, we, we, uh, we talked a lot to our partners and um, a lot to Chic and its members and really found that PPE for CHWs was, was crucial. There was no question about it. We very quickly realized that no one at the time had actually scoped what PPE and how much of it was required. You know, really never before was there an advocacy play for PPE for CHWs at this time. And we know that we cannot really advocate for solutions when we haven't quantified the problem or at least attempted to. So that was the first step. That was our first entrance into this work. Um, we supported our staff in working together with Sheik to do this. And we understood, uh, so that we understood what was needed um, as a baseline. And we've been really thrilled to see the analysis uh, leveraged for this fund. It's, it's really been a rapid fire journey, journey of evidence to action. I think that this is a really compelling investment uh, to be totally honest. And 
first, I want to say that operating with such speed was possible because of the flexible funding and resources enabled by these philanthropic efforts. I also really want to take a minute just to highlight what it is we know and what that means and, and lends itself to the, the impact of this investment. We know that CHWs are always the last in line for support in global health. We know that CHWs are relied upon for care, whether it's formalized or not. And there's no other dedicated effort that is focusing on protecting them amidst this unprecedented crisis right now. The efforts that do exist, uh, they just take a lot of time to materialize because they're bigger and more bureaucratic. And this fund, you know, with this fund is, it's going, it's happening and supplies are already on the ground and delivered in huge quantity and delivering huge quantities of PPE to CHWs. We run the risk of reversing so many gains in the morbidity and mortality reduction from preventable disease, diseases serviced by CHWs. This is, this is a really scary thought. Um, this, this is the moment to invest in catalytic efforts that can make a difference right now because this is an emergency. It's still an emergency and it's going to be an emergency for a while. Uh, we also want to ensure that the impact from this sustains. We believe that this radical collaboration is doing both extremely well. The other thing that I really just want to emphasize is that I can personally vouch for this team. Each member is contributing a unique advantage. They're operating with integrity and skill. And this is really why I believe that this investment will not only have immediate impact, but, but catalyze real and lasting change. The community health advocates operating this work are working to ensure that all countries in scope are prioritizing, prioritizing CHWs in their supply and resource mobilization plans. This is not an easy task, but it is one that this group and this team and this consortium that we're all really committed to. And I think that that is going to, that means that it's going to have an impact and it already has. And um, I, again, I just wanna say, I feel really privileged and lucky to be part of this group and part of this, this team and this conversation. So Mosin, back over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, English. Thank you um, for, for the amazing work you do. And also Tom, um, for the investments that you have made in communities around Africa. Um, I'm super excited about the work that is already being done and the potential um, to, to do more. Um, so we're going to move straight into question and answers. I know that there have been answers to some questions already, but I see one to Ramatu that um, is still open. If um, I'll just ask Ramatu if she's still there to respond to this specific question to her. How do people in the community react when they see you in PPE? Um, do they want you to take it off or do they understand it's for your own protection? Well, um, due to the breakout of the pandemic, they understand because sensitization is on. So I don't have any challenges with the PPE with, in the community because the people always um, um, believe that the community health workers are the right people that will lead them for what they need, right? So when it started, there was some explanation, but later they understand after sensitizing them, the needs and the importance of, being, of, of using the PPE. Thank you very much, Ramachu. Um, I, I think there is one here for Madeline. It's, uh, it's a question around um, the MOH coordination um, in terms of distribution. Um, how can you ensure that the pro procured items reach the community's health workers specifically? Thanks, Masoon. Um, Yes, I think that's actually one of the differentiating factors about this collaboration um, that most en entities that Thomas was talking about uh, and James referenced actually don't have verified last mile distribution plans, whereas this effort, the COVID-19 Action Fund for Africa does. And that's due to two things. One, that we're working directly with ministries of health 
Two, that in each country, we are also working with civil society partners. And three, that we have expertise, not just in procurement and purchasing, um, for instance, uh, direct reliefs uh, expertise, but we were sure to bring on as a founding partner, uh, this collaborative uh, Village Reach, uh, who specializes literally in last mile distribution. Um, and so uh, we're not just kind of respond, you know, dumping goods at a port and leaving people to be responsible for moving goods uh, out of it. Um, a key piece of the country engagement from the get go has been these plans uh, to quantify the number of CHWs in the country make do a needs net assessment and a gap analysis for what their PPE uh, needs are missing uh, or what PPE needs are missing, um, procure those needs uh, and then follow a plan to get the PPE uh, directly to the last mile. And again, uh, with the village reach expertise and partners in each country um, from last mile health in Liberia to Chai and Zimbabwe to all of these entities that have a, a long solidarity based experience over many years of working with ministries of health and working uh, to get uh, PPE directly to community health workers. Um, that's, that's really how we differentiate ourselves. It's not just, uh, you know, sending stuff into the void. There are 30, 30 partners and ministries of health on the ground um, that have been making these plans and verifying them uh, from the get go. Thank you very much, Madeline. And just to highlight that one of the pillars of the uh, COVID-19 Action Fund for Africa is serving the invisible cater. Um, so I believe that all of that is captured in that one, um, in that sentence. And so as we round up, I think it's important to share our vision in, in statistics. 30 plus partners involved, um, 1 million community health workers protected, 400 million people served, and 24 countries covered um, around the globe. Um, it's important that we all get on board um, as a global community. And I would also speak for um, the Africa Philanthropy Forum that we're working actively to engage um, more members of our community so that um, we all pull resources together to get to where we really want to be because a few organizations, a few individuals um, cannot, cannot get us to to the finish line, to our goalposts. So we all need everyone on board. Okay, so we have a, we have a couple more questions to take. Um, there is an, an, uh, um, a question around the verification process for producing surgical masks locally. Um, how long does it take to verify the PPE is produced? Is there anyone on the panel that can speak to this? Yeah, this is Tom. This is Thomas. I, I can uh, most soon. <clears throat> I think um, I've, I neglected to mention that one of the key priorities uh, in, in purchasing is to make sure that as money is mobilized for African CHWs, that the money is spent in Africa to the maximum extent possible. I think that that has been a challenge. I think the market has been upset for the manufacturing PPE, but uh, in Kenya recently, we've uh, had our colleague visit two sites. We have to make sure that it meets all the country requirements, the international standards, uh, European or American standards for filtration and protection and, uh, you know, all the, the, the features of a level two R surgical mask. And there's a lot of industrial engineering that goes into these masks. And there's a lot of ones that, uh, as we've seen, unfortunately, are fake that made it, uh, have made it into um, all over the world. So I think we've been very careful working only with uh, approved vendors who's, who submit their products for quality testing by independent labs and are suitable for commercial sale in either the United States or Europe. And we will continue to do that. I think there will be, there's some manufacturing going on in Africa. We just, the scale isn't there yet given the need, but that's certainly a priority. Um, and it may be worth paying a bit of a higher price per unit cost because of the additional, the avoidance of the, the transportation involved, at least uh, from China, that's so far thankfully been covered, but that remains a key priority. But everything that will be provided will be validated by an independent lab and meet the most rigorous international standards. And that has been done so far for all the items that have been purchased. Thank you. 
Um, thank you very much. Um, so I'll just, um, it, the, we, we have on the slide um, what has been done so far and where we are going because I know a couple of questions have come around that. Um, so for 25 million, um, it, it, takes to, it takes PPEs to approximately 500,000 community health workers, 24 countries. That has been achieved um, within three months. Um, and then um, we're looking at 50 million PPEs to 1 million community health workers in 24 countries for six months. Um, and the best case scenario is $100 million um, to get um, PPEs to 1 million community health workers in 24 countries for 12 months. So this is where we're going. Um, this is the goal and this is um, the, the, the reason we're having this conversation. Right, um, so. Just to come in there, just to clarify what we've already achieved and this is what Thomas was um, sharing. We've been able to get PPE to half the countries, 12 countries um, for between three to six months. And we've done that with um, just over $12.5 million. So again, that's due to the really competitive pricing that we've been able to do. Uh, we've been able to satisfy already 18% of the need um, just right out of the gate. And um, the, the three tiers you see here on the screen that Musin explained is what we think we can do when we get to each new level um, of funding. And we're inviting folks to join us in continuing uh, pushing this train down the tracks. Thank you very much, Madeline. Um, so and uh, we have we have another question um, for Thomas. Um, can some of the PPEs for community health workers be sourced from SMEs in country who have ramped up to produce level two surgical masks? Um, I believe this is for Thomas. Yes. I mean, I think you know, assuming that the quality is there and the prices is, is good. I think we want to encourage, and that's a key priority to make sure, you know, the supply chains are contracting, you know, people want them shorter, given kind of the, the high cost of transportation, that was an, an additional barrier. So much of the PPE was manufactured in China. Um, I think uh, companies like 3M that have really been the, the world leader in this, they were subjected to the uh, kind of the US government basically um, invoking uh, the Defense Production Act so that they were first in line to obtain uh, the product. So there was a big shortage and into that vacuum there a lot of ramping up has been done. Not all the quality has been there. So that's why um, the, the standards are clear. The testing labs are established. So we want to make sure and foster the development uh, with this, these funds, the sustaining value of having local manufacturing there's fund, well, there's not enough funding, but I think with the funding, if there are sources and anyone on the call, anyone who has a line on a manufacturer that is manufacturing any of the products, gloves, masks, shields, gowns, uh, to in uh, the highest standards, please let us know. I think we're doing everything we can. We have a tremendous, the energetic, person who's a great negotiator and has been in touch with everybody, but I think it, it, the market remains unsettled, uh, the prices remain high, transportation remains a challenge, and we want to address all of them. And thankfully so far, the pricing has been good, the transport costs out of China have been absorbed by WFP, so that uh, averts costs. And I think to Madeline's point, there's been about $12,750,000 put in the pot. Uh, direct relief put in 10, which is a huge amount of money for us. We're not a, typically, we don't play this role. Um, Crown Family Philanthropies put in two and a half million dollars. The Johnson & Johnson family of companies have, have put in other funds. And we still have, depending on how the, the transport costs and some of the next shipments are lining up, we have at, at most $3 million still remaining. So everything that's been accomplished has been accomplished at lower cost than we thought because of uh, the participation of WFP in particular that has absorbed those transport costs. Um, so we're looking, the money's, you know, what we want is the stuff and the service. Uh, money's a means to that end. So if there are lines on the fine uh, products that are going to meet the highest standards, that's what we want the money for. But ultimately we want, you know, money's just a means to accomplish, uh, you trade money for goods and services. So what we want are the goods and services at the lowest price possible. So any, anyone, please, if there's a line 
on uh, a local manufacturing in Africa, that's a wonderful thing. We want to encourage and support that, and that will take a priority for everybody. I think everybody agrees with that. I hope that answers the question, Hosun. I believe it does. Thank you so much. Um, that was very explanatory. Uh, moving on quickly, um, I, I think there's a question that Madeline will be able to assist with, which is around sustainability of such projects that come up during emergencies. What happens after the emergency? Is this something that you can speak to, Madeline? Sure, I'll just say uh, very briefly that that's actually something that this, pardon me, that this fund has already begun to think about. Um, uh, and actually work on. So we're on two parallel tracks. One, we're in an emergency and we're trying to build systems and that's what we're focused on. We're focused on getting as much PPE uh, to CHWs as fast as possible and as comprehensively as possible. At the same time, we recognize that some of these supply chain issues in terms of distributional um, problems and delays and pricing and lack of local manufacturing capacity long predated this crisis and we're simply exacerbated by this crisis and so actually we're doing some analysis work to um, figure out how could we transition um, the infrastructure that's been set up for this fund and the partnership between experts like Village Reach and Direct Relief and all our partners in country to maybe um, uh, try to solve some of these problems over the long term and we're happy to kind of share that uh, once it becomes a bit more concrete but rest assured that that's um, not a question that we're overlooking. Thank you very much, Madeline. Um, so uh, moving on to the next question, community health workers, um, most of them have poor storage facilities. Any experience from um, countries where there's improved storage? storage? Um, Ramatu, do you have any, any experience where storage has been improved in, in any of the communities? Yes, um, storage has been improving so many chiefdom in my own side here in Sierra Leone, especially Connor District. Um, okay, do, 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 is, do you want, is there any specifics around, you know, how that was done? Do you, how, how you moved from poor to improved? Yeah, um, one thing is uh, partners in health have been engaging us with um, much training for us to go about it safe. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ramatu. Um, so there is a question to James. Um, some of the US-based funders may still be concerned about growing COVID numbers within the states and Europe. What is anticipated progression of COVID in the 24 countries in which um, this fund is focused? And what do you say to those funders about how PPE is, how PPE is um, to ensure that COVID doesn't spread as much in Africa. Yeah, I would say in some conversations that I continue to have with my former funder colleagues, I still hear some skepticism on two fronts. One is, is PPE really necessary for community health workers? I think we've, we have, um, provided ample um, evidence on this call that PPE is necessary for CHWs to fulfill their full promise. And then the second question we sometimes get is, will COVID really play out in Africa? Um, will, will the numbers spike in the way that we all are worried about? And I think if you continue to look at the way that it has played out in certain parts of the continent, whether it's South Africa or Ethiopia, we can see where numbers have gone up. And I would just advise you to keep looking at the, um, the evidence from Africa CDC or even our friends at Resolve to Save Lives who are tracking this across the continent carefully. And I continue to be convinced um, that we're going to be dealing with this epidemic for the next three or more years on, in our context. Because getting to a vaccine is one thing, getting equitable distribution of a vaccine is another. So COVID is the new context. We're gonna to need to address this in all of our um, sites, um, both as organizations and our Ministry of Health partners to make sure that health workers are fully protected. Because as we move from the early epidemic, as it moves out to rural and remote communities, it will be, the response will depend more and more on community health workers as we move from testing to treatment options to the vaccination options 
we're going to need PPE throughout all of that and vaccinations aren't going to be uh, covering the entire population at once. So we're gonna need PPE for the long run here. And um, I think that it's probably just a false comparison to say, should we put our resources into the US response or the African response? I think with a health equity perspective, I would say that these communities have been disproportionately affected by the global marketplace that's been described here, a fragmented marketplace, a marketplace that's favored those who already have access to power and privilege and can control the manufacturing and distribution of PPE. So if this effort here um, can do anything to disrupt the, that power and do our best to distribute PPE to those communities and those places which are most vulnerable and actually have the least access to the support services in facilities that would be necessary, like uh, the ability to intubate and provide oxygen when needed. I think that that's a worthwhile investment and I, that's the value proposition I see here. Thank you very much, um, James. Well done. And I think that's a perfect way to wrap this up. Thank you so much for your time. Today, we're very excited that you dedicated this hour um, to us, and, and we believe that we'll be able to move forward, um, given all that we have heard today. To learn more, you can see up on the screen, please reach out to Heather Bennett. Um, I would like to say a big thank you to all our supporters. Thank you so much, and thank you to the speakers as well. Have a good rest of the day.